Welcome and thank you for joining the Q&A for White Tiger. I'm Gwen Diglis, Deputy Director for the American Cinematheque, and I'd like to invite you to visit our website, americancinematheque.com, where you can find information about our upcoming program and how you can support the American Cinematheque by becoming a member and making a donation. Also, don't forget to sign up for our eblast. Um, I'd like to thank Netflix uh, for making this conversation possible. Uh, White Tiger is streaming on Netflix, and the conversation is with director um, Ramin Bahani and uh, moderated by uh, director, film historian, and um, executive uh, James Seamus. Enjoy. And hello, everybody uh, out there uh, uh, here with the Q&A. I see the numbers are rising. It's really exciting to rejoin you, Ramin, and congratulations on the film. Congratulations today on on the long list at the uh, British Academy Awards. Uh, that's the, it's a, it's a pretty hefty place to be making that cut. Of course, now the next round for the nominations, but that was, that was fantastic to see. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great to see you because we haven't been able to see each other in person due to COVID. Um, yeah. We, yeah. we have a long, a long history together and I, I owe a lot to you. So I'm very happy to see you. Yeah, well, it's a long history, although, as we know from having just seen your film, long histories and people owing a lot to each other is not necessarily a good thing, but I hope in our case it is. Clearly, uh, you have, um, uh, uh, and I guess we can, we can, we can make this explicit. Uh, I think it's been how many years since you were an undergraduate? Obviously, um, friends with the author of the underlying material, The White Knight, the novel, um, uh, who was also an undergraduate at Columbia. And you attended uh, one of my classes. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I know you almost as long as I know Arvind, um, because I, I was an undergraduate at Columbia in the, in the early to mid 90s. I think I had your class maybe in 94, 95. And um, I had a class, I, was, I studied film theory and I had a class. You, you were teaching a graduate level class. I was an undergrad and I somehow weaseled my way in. You somehow accepted me. And it was a B movie class. Um, and of course, uh, as you're one of the smartest people I know, you, you spoke about these B-movies in the most eloquent and subversive ways. And um, yeah, I, I never had classes in filmmaking, but I, I learned somehow by making a lot of crappy short films, but really by watching movies with you, Annette Insdorf, Hamid Debashi, you know, and um, thinking about them and thinking about how do you put things together. And, so I, I've always said I, I, I learned filmmaking by my professors like you at teaching me theory at Columbia. Well, thank you. And by the way, that's, that's, that's great to hear, although please don't do that at home. Learning film theory is actually the worst way to go about learning how to make movies, but some people like Remy Barani appear to have survived it. In fact, you were a very memorable student. I mean, I've had a couple thousand students in the meantime at, at, at Columbia, um, but you kept in touch, you were assiduous over the years when you started making short films. I think you went back first to North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, and then and then I think the run. But yeah, and it was always wonderful to hear from you. And then, of course, it was like, oh, my God, that dude is actually making movies. And, <laughs> um, and in a way, you know, one of the things I, I loved about Way Tiger was, in fact, watching an evolution of your own filmmaking, um, which, as you know, I've been an admirer of from from day one. Uh, and your early films with so much empathy, so much attention, so much care for looking at those overlooked. Right but also um, coming out of a number of uh, filmmaking traditions that we associate with things like Italian neorealism and Tosica, but also, of course, with the, the, the great observational, but also creative work that comes out of Iran and many others, you know. Um, and so I, I'd love to ask you how you feel about where, in this moment in time, the editing style, the shooting style, really stylistically, this is, I mean, if you took take a look at some of, you know, uh, Pushman Cart, Goodbye Solo. Um, and if, by the way, out there, folks, if you haven't seen these films, please find them. Um, I'm sure they're available one way or the other. Um, they're just spectacular films. I mean, you, you, you hit the ground running. There was no juvenilia. I mean, they, but, but they're, they, uh, it's in, in some ways, I, I think those of us who pay attention can see that they were made by the same filmmaker. But in many ways, in surface details, it would be hard to make that case if you didn't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, um, I actually, I, I just wanted to say, um, just because they weren't easy to find, Man Push Card, my first film, and Chop Shop, my second film, 
have been out of circulation for a couple of years, but they're coming to the Criterion Collection this month. So the di yeah, yeah, the discs will be out um, later in February and they'll be on the channel with a couple of shorts I did. Um, but totally, James, it's a different, it's a different style. Maybe the, the, I try to think, what have I done like this at all? And the closest I can think of is this short film I did in 2009 after Goodbye Solo, my third feature called Plastic Bag with Werner Herzog as the voice of a plastic bag. And I mention it because it's the only film I had with voiceover that had a weird structure to it that was more playful. And um, the, the, the themes I think in The White Tiger are, are similar to a lot of my work in terms of the kind of crushing impact of, of globalization or money or capitalism or corruption like you saw in, in, in a number of the films, maybe 99 Homes, for example, looking at that, as you said, the unseen or the underclass or the, the underdog character, like focusing on a servant, that's something all, almost all the films have been in that kind of category. But the style was really different and it came from the novel, you know, the Arvin's no novel was so propulsive in reading it, like when you try to hold a book, it flies away, it just jumps out of your hand and, and it was so sarcastic and satirical and, and um, edgy, you know. Um, it was about pretty serious themes and some searing ideas, but it was always kind of playful. And um, I kept trying to find that tone. I'd never done anything tonally like that, but I wanted it to match the book. And um, in a way, I'm very glad I, I didn't have the chance to make it when it came out in 2008, the novel. Because I, I know if someone said, here's money, go make White Tiger in 2008, I would have cut all of it out. I would have made it a very narrow slice of it and I would have told it straight and I would have cut out most of Arvin's tone, which would have been a shame. And um, so somehow I, 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 I don't know, I kind of felt Arvin, well, Arvin and I know each other for 25 years and um, I've been reading rough drafts of the book for four years before it was published. And when he called me a few years ago and said, do you think you could be interested or want to do the white tiger? And I, and I said, my God, I've always wanted to do it. I didn't realize until now recently in talking James about it, that I couldn't have made it back then creatively, you know? Yeah, that's wild. I mean, one of the things, obviously a, a tremendous central performance by uh, Adash Gurab and, and uh, as well, uh, but one of the things that the, the voiceover does that first person narration that you find in a novel, you know, it's very difficult to first person narrate a movie because of the objectivity of the camera, right? Which is always looking at, at the narrator among others, right? Um, you have point of view shots in there and, and it's, it's wonderful how you use them um, in the film. But it's, um, but it's very difficult to align a movie with a with the narration, and it brings up an interesting question, which is, of course, the um, uh, the believability of what we're seeing, because it is a story being told by somebody who's writing a letter to the Chinese premier and kind of showing off, and it does um, make me suspicious, uh, suspicious in so many ways. Um, you know, I, re I read some of the reviews after I saw the film, not before, which I'm, I'm glad I, I waited, and there's a there's a standard you know plot outline about the movie which hews very carefully to the plot as laid out by, by Balram himself um, of the, this underdog, underclass, you know, low caste uh, hero who has to struggle as an entrepreneur, right? To, to overcome uh, this, the, the, the entrenched power of the landed gentry um, and really become this, 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 the, new, the new brown man who's gonna take over the world uh, from, from the Americans and the whites and, and everyone else, right? And I realized like, on the one hand, you could read the movie precisely as that, and I think that's how it's read. Um, and I think that's a completely reasonable read. But on the other hand, I actually think there's a read of the movie which is like, no, actually, this is a, clearly an entrepreneur, right? He's, he's running Uber, and we know what kind of personality the guy who ran Uber, I mean, the, the, the white tiger drivers, um, uh, the, the, the guy who founded Uber was here in the States. And, um, and there is this kind of mythology, self-mythologizing, uh, that may be actually uh, interesting to, to ask you about, which is, of course, like, you know, I did it myself. Like, the way I did it was not this PC American way, uh, nor am I landed gentry. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a killer, 
I'm a once in a generation white tiger and I deserve this. So it's, it's more like he's getting, giving himself cred for a kind of, you know, um, ubermensch criminality that is precisely the, the Mark Cuban vibe, right? It's like, it's just, it's just actually a pro-entrepreneurial text as opposed to uh, an expose of, uh, uh, of the injustices and entrenched uh, rigors of, uh, of a society still mired in the past. In fact, it's not. It's a society that's on the move and on the make. Uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying. In fact, I think the novel is even more open to that. Um, I think that because it, the, some of his narrative, because it's really it's just first person narration. So his impression of other people is more exaggerated. You know, like Pinky Madam and Ashok are, are very exaggerated in the novel. They, they aren't really fully drawn characters, nor, nor should they be because he doesn't have access to them or know them. It's just the perception that he has of them. So in this part, in like the movie, I had to develop those characters because I have to talk to my actors. They have to be, have their own motivations, their own desires, their own needs and scenes that are outside of Balram. So I think the novel even more so, but you know, if you told me, for example, he never met Wen Jai Bao, I could believe that. Um, the final shot of the movie, I have no clue if he's really talking to his drivers, that's just in his head, or he's just making some, I don't know. So yeah, yeah there, there's an, you could question a lot of what he's saying, you know? And you do such a great job of seeding that uh, in the film. You know, at crucial moments when we see or don't see things, you know, when, when the you know, agency I, of the narration is forced from the, the object, objectivity or supposed objectivity of the image, especially the ending, obviously, is amazing. Yeah, I, I tried to do things, James, that I didn't know if it would work, because in the novel, it's, Arvind is even more, is really wilder in the book. In the book, he talks to animals and they talk back to him. There's all kinds of stuff like that. I tried things that I don't, I didn't know if they would work or not. Like, I don't know, he, he tells Ashok, I want to smash your skull and steal your money. In the novel, he's thinking it. In the movie, he just says it. And there's no like camera trick or editing trick. There's really nothing to indicate that he did or didn't say it. I'm just assuming you know he didn't say it because Ashok doesn't really react. And I, I, I've never seen the movie with an audience because of COVID. Like I couldn't, I just had to email links to people and say, what did you think? And then they would call me three days later. So I, I have never sat there with people, but, or, or even the scene where he, he can, he's sits across from that man taking a crap. Um, and the guy just starts laughing. I don't know how much of that really happened. Um, but it was a scene in the novel I loved and it was so weird. And I thought it was charting his descent into madness a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, so all those scenes are on the edge of not, not even knowing how much of it really happened. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm really glad I asked you that because I, I was, your response really confirms for me a certain depth um, and ambiguity and ambivalence in the film that in a lot of its reception has been, you know, uh, justifiably missing, probably because in fact, people are just watching. I mean, obviously it's Netflix stepped in and, and, and stepped up uh, and made it. So that, and all, any movie, even a theatrically released movie, so-called is still the vast majority of its audience is gonna watch it uh, through streaming. Um, yeah. That was before COVID and it will be so after. But there is a sense in which also the unnervingness of the comedy uh, as one ingests it by oneself, right? Um, yeah. Gives, weirdly at this moment, this movie a different valence than I think it might otherwise have had. That is to say, uh, to me, it, uh, maybe it's just the time or whatever, maybe I'm just recuperating how, you know, semi, actually not semi miserable, so many of us are just, you know, quarantined. But the funniness was, ah, you know, uh, and I think a, a group laugh might have done more even to paper over a lot of what you've been talking about as your intention. Yeah, it's possible. I don't, I, again, I don't know because I have never seen the movie with human <laughs> beings. It's so, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, we, we were obviously, the, not I should say obviously, but the goal was to show the movie in Venice and Toronto where most of my films have premiered and later Alberto and Cameron saw the film and loved it, but Netflix wasn't doing the festival route. And then it did get a theatrical release. It played in a lot of theaters across the country and in many other countries, but I'm in New York and a lot of people are in LA. And so in, I couldn't see the movie in a theater. Um, and, and it's of course 
quite dangerous anyway for, some, for, for a lot of people to do that. So I haven't had that experience. I'm just waiting maybe sometime in the future, there'll be a screening somewhere I can see it with human beings. You know, it would be really interesting to see if you could uh, sur surreptitiously have somebody take a, a film of an audience and one that's not just, you know, spread out eight feet, six feet, feet apart. Yeah. Uh, just well, just uh, that, that in the room thing, right? I, I would like to play though. Um, in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, the, the, the flip side is it goes to, you know, 200 million people at once in 190 countries. Yeah. And it was number one in like, for days on end, it was the number one movie on Netflix in the world. And I think they're gonna, the numbers were kind of huge. I, I can't really believe it because you've seen my other films, they're, they're more independent films, so you don't get seen by tons of people. And um, so that part's awesome. And I'm very excited. You were talking about surreptitiously doing things. I'm so happy, James, that uh, my family in Iran has already pirated the movie. People in Iran have pirated it and subtitled it in Persian already. So that my family has seen the film and called to say they saw the film with Persian subtitles already, which I'm so happy about. That they can elude these absurd That's embargoes. Yeah, yeah. So I even told another, Netflix I'm happy that you. Yeah, exactly. Well, but you know, it's, it's a uh, it, it should be seen. It's just, uh, still spreads the word on yeah. social media. You know, where there is Netflix. Yeah, why not? It's okay. You know, back to this question of style and content, which I think is really what the, uh, in many ways, the film also proposes, which is, you know, that both the difference and the alignment of image and present self-presentation and how things look. And I, I, I really want to commend you and your co-editor, uh, Tim Strita, who, of course, I remember as a kid, he was the assistant editor on Crouching Tiger. Are you uh, serious? Yes, and on, he was the assistant editor on Nicole Hollis Center's first film, uh, Walking and Talking, that we made back in the day. Wow. Uh, pretty, back in the day, and a bunch of other great movies. Um, so I, I knew him when. But, uh, you know, it's not simply a stylistic difference that I mark between the earlier films and, and, and this one. Um, but a, I'd say a technical one. The editing on this seemed, I mean, I, it, it felt like so much of this film was built through what must have been a really fun editorial process because so much of um, the experience of the movie is, is relays of very specific kind of uh, uh, cutaways and inserts and close-ups and movement. You're really on, you know, I think uh, one critic rightfully said street level um, and, and our gaze is constantly being interrupted in a sense, but also directed by Balram, but even sometimes he can't, he doesn't have the whole thing. And, and if you could talk a little bit about the editorial process on this and how it's different from your other movies. Yeah, it was really great working with Tim. I mean, just because of COVID, it's interesting to say a little bit that, you know, he was assembling when I was shooting in India. And then when I came back, I moved everybody out of company three, the lab in, in Manhattan. And they came to Brooklyn near where I live. And we rented a four bedroom apartment there where I was cutting in one room, Tim was cutting in one room and our assistants were in rooms. And, you know, by March 14th, everybody was gone. And I would walk to this empty room, empty space every day and Tim was cutting at home and our assistants were in their homes and everyone was just kind of locked. And believe it or not, I was often filming the, the screen uh, with WhatsApp and I would, I would WhatsApp Tim or as me in Paris, my creative partner in Paris from all my movies. And I would WhatsApp them three versions of the same scene asking what did they think? So this just on, a, on that level was so weird. But um, yeah, the cutting, I, I it's a lot, you talked about this earlier, there's a lot more subjective shots than I typically have in my own films, a lot more. And again, going to the, the film, it had, there were so many rich details in that novel. And then even more when I got to India and saw them, that when you're talking about close-ups and inserts, I was thinking often about um, so many different directors, but that specifically in this case, Scorsese's work with inserts, um, either as separate shots or as shots that start on inserts and move away to um, the world and then maybe come back to an insert because of, you know, in a movie like, well, in any of his films, but it's specifically in Goodfellas, its ability to show us and take us into another world that we don't know. And it's often about wanting to highlight the details of that world that we don't know. And so I thought in this case, there would be a lot of people who wouldn't, let's say outside of India, who may not know anything in this world. But even within India, I thought there were people who wouldn't know this world because they don't know the world of the servant or the driver. It was Arvind who went out there and just said, I want to make a novel about a servant. 
Um, so that was part of it. And then, you know, it was shooting it, understanding that there would be voiceover on these short scenes. The, the screenplay had 240 scenes, which is about 120 more than I would normally have in a feature film. Um, you know, X number got thrown in the garbage later, but we shot them all and you're shooting them thinking of how am I going to, how are these things going to be brief shots or well, how's the camera going to move to get me from one place to the next? So you're thinking about all that in, in the shooting stage of the film with your, you know, with the creative team and um, thinking about, especially in the first half, wanting things to be a little bit playful and off, you know, like um, someone mentioned to me the other day, the scene where, where Balram is describing what it's like to sleep in the village. And he says, that everyone sleeps together and they look like one creature in millipede. So a, a, a line out of the novel. So it was like, oh, how are you gonna show that without just showing it? It's gotta show it with the way the book felt, which I thought was, you know, this high, high angle shot on, on the women and quick pan over to, as you were describing, so, to the, <laughs> oh, oh, the grainy and close up and then the men, you know, quickly, just to get the feeling of how he remembered in the energy of the storytelling, you know? Um, so that, I, it was a really long and Also, day. by the way, yeah. And, and I mean, look, doing voiceover well, obviously you had the novel and that great voice and, and totally that voice is going to inflect everything, but it doesn't, it, oddly, it doesn't dominate. It doesn't, it's, it's interesting. It, it, it inflects and it drives, but it's still a, a, you still maintain a primarily visual world but a visual world that's also saturated with sound and i thought the sound design was really really interesting in the film too oh, and i'd great. like you know getting into the weeds on this but but there's a kind of uh you know a, 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 not just point of view but a, a point of audition and point of focalization for sound that plays heavily you know uh in a, in a lot of the film it seems to me um as you're as you're centering ballroom but as he's kind of inside and outside so many of these scenes yes I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. I mean, well, for the voiceover, a lot of that was going, going back into um, Kind Hearts and Cornets and Julie Jim as kind of more origin points. And then coming into Fight Club and Goodfellas and Taxi Driver. Fight Club was interesting because it had internal voiceover, but also social commentary voiceover. Mm -hmm. So Ikea and Starbucks gets replaced with the rooster coop, you know? Um, and then, the sound, I love sound. Editing and sound are some of my favorite parts of the movie. And I have an awesome sound team that, that we worked on. This is our second project together. Jacob Ribikoff here in, in New York doing the sound design. And then Tom Fleischman that was the mixer. And um, we worked a lot on sound. I, I brought Jacob in er, really early in the edit. He saw even the, the rough assembly and started feeding us sounds from that point. Um, and, and working a lot on the very, very specific sounds. And then also with sound and music, it was always about what, what was in Balram's head and what was the character going through in that moment and how will sound, how will sound help that process? How will sound put us more in the head of the character? And so we did a lot of work on that. Um, and then vo voiceover, it was, all, it was always rewriting it as the movie kept changing and then making it less and less and less, you know, I don't know if there's too much or not because I saw it too many times and I, I couldn't watch it with people, but we just kept erring on maybe we should take this one out, you know? Yeah. Well, I know that we are winding up on this part of the discussion because I see that there are so many people with so many great questions for you. So I'm just, I'm, I'm scrolling through this q and I think there's, there's already a, a bunch that are, are, have been fed into the uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, other things. So I think I'm going to hand uh, proceedings over to Gwen. Thank you. James, James, you. Um, when are we going to hear about your new series? Because I, I'm so eager. Oh, yeah. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so we're going to hear about it shortly. I've been, I've, I've moved into the TV world myself, but I am under uh, strict orders. In fact, I will be killed by my driver if I mention uh, the series before <laughs> the studio announces it. But it's okay. been fun. But I also want to say again, uh, congrats on that, uh, the long list today at the BAFTAs. And you gave me an opening. You're joining Good Company, a film, a lovely film I produced, uh, The Assistant with Julia Garner. 
uh, also made the cut for right, uh, congratulations. Hector. And congratulations. so, uh, so uh, we feel a very good company with you and Same. a great company with you. Thanks again for inviting me to share this discussion. Thanks, we have James. a lot of catching up to do. Uh, we'll do it another time. And Thank thanks you. I can't wait for your, your show. Thank you, Jane. All right, Thank take you, care. James. Bye bye. Bye bye. And so to, to continue on the, on the sound um, design for the film and maybe go into um, the music and the soundtrack, we have some questions from the audience about um, the soundtrack and um, you know, the influence of Indian music or you know, where was your, what were your inspiration in terms of creating the soundtrack? Yeah, I worked um, a lot with Michael Hill, who's my music supervisor on a lot of my films. And also in this case, the, the producer in India, Makul Deora, who was my partner in India, um, he's also a musician, so he was really helpful. And you know, in, in the novel, Arvind actually highlights what kind of music Ashok is listening to. And it's things like Coldplay and Sting and Enya. But well, those, some of those things are really expensive, but also they didn't seem to match the vibe of what we were shooting. So we started shifting into um, trying to get the certain, Western tracks that we thought a shook might listen to or Pinky might listen to from the early to mid 2000s. That's kind of where the Gorilla song came from, which we had playing in the car on set actually. And um, Fat Joe, which was a lot of fun to pick, but then also trying to find that East meets India meets the Western world with Punjabi MC, because that was such a huge hit to Where the Boys. And I think immediately when you hear it, you're like, oh, I remember that, I remember that. Or I was just at a wedding that had that. And then the, getting the version that had Jay-Z on it kind of opened it up in a different way to more people, I thought. And, um, so, and, and then some, there's some really good Punjabi hip hop in there. But really the most exciting part was the last song because it's by this Indian rap artist I like a lot named Divine. Um, he's a huge guy in India. Um, and he comes out of, a, in his words, the slums for, uh, uh, you know, in India. So he knew the story, he could feel that. He rose up from nothing to something. Um, and it was awesome to work with him on that final cue. And he brought in um, Pusha T and Vince Staples, people that he loved and admired, and then they contributed. So that creating that original song with, with them was awesome. Um, question about, you know, what was the biggest challenge you faced making a movie in a foreign country with a, la a language that is not yours and a culture completely different than yours? Um, there were a lot of challenges, but you know, I don't know, I, I felt very good there um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, most of my movies are about locations and people that I don't know. And then I go find them and research and spend time with them, like pushcart vendors and man pushcart that James may mentioned or people losing their homes or real estate brokers who kick people out of their homes. For 99 Homes, I spent months in, in Fort Myers, Florida and other places in Florida. So I like to do that. So that part, I felt good. M my family's from Iran. I, I lived in Iran for three years as an adult, including in villages like the one you see in the film because my dad comes from a village very similar to that. Um, he didn't have electricity or running water until he was six or seven. Um, you know, he, he didn't have a water buffalo, but he had donk they had donkeys everywhere. And, and chickens and animals, the same as Balram describes as, even as Balram uses animals to describe people, mongoose, stork, because he grew up with that. And I, I know that from my dad and having lived in that village. So I, I felt comfortable there. Um, I hired a crew that was 99% Indian. Mm -hmm. So I, I brought one production designer from North Carolina. I brought a cinematographer from Italy who came with a assistant camera for focus and whatnot, and then the DGA AD. Um, but every other department head was Indian and my crew was Indian. And that really helps with authenticity. And, and um, also I, I would say it was the first time in my career that I turned around and everybody kind of looked like me. So I don't know, I felt good. I felt comfortable and, and I, I liked being there. Uh you know, staying on the question of authenticity, can you talk about the casting and is there a specific way you do casting for your film and how did you adapt it to uh, being in India and casting? Well, with, um, with the lead, Adarsh, um, there, were, there were Western diaspora actors that I loved, 
that I want to work with who were interested in the part and, and there were Bollywood actors who stars that wanted to play it. But spending time in India for a couple of months researching and, and being there, um, I felt like the actor should come from India. He should be born and raised there. He should live there and preferably not be a star. Um, I wanted a newcomer, someone that could kind of personify the underdog, trying to cl climb his way up. And Adarsh came in and he was just phenomenal. He was a trained actor, but he'd never had a leading role. He'd done some smaller parts and he blew me away in the audition. And, and when I like people in an audition, I immediately read with them, but I, I like to go wildly off book with them and improvise and see what they'll do in improvisations and how, how mobile they are, they are how, how they handle that. And he was great at that. And um, he put in the work. He, he lived anonymously in a village for a few weeks. Um, he got a job in a tea shop in Delhi um, under the name Balram and would work 12 hours a day for like a nickel. And um, uh, at a certain point, he, he, I texted him. I said, I need you to come for a call back. And so he didn't know what to do because he had a job now washing dishes. So he told the boss, I've got to go buy a bunch of bananas. And he ran out to get them. And he just kept running and running and running till he got to the production office so we could do a callback with a different actor. And the next day, he's wandering around Delhi trying to get another job. And he's just walking around. And some men were loading a truck full of metal. And they just called him and said, hey, you, come here start picking this metal and put it in the truck. They didn't ask him if he wanted a job. They just told him to do it. And so he did it. And then they gave him a small amount of money and he came to the office. His hands were cut up. We got him a doctor, put some ointment. And a few days later, the producer went to a luxury mall to, I don't know, buy something. And he looks out of the corner of his eye and he sees ballroom with a bunch of drivers waiting for their masters to come out of the mall. And he squatted with them there, smoking a beady, chit-chatting. You know, so he really put himself in, into the part. Through the process. Yeah. So all those questions we've, we've had are, are, you know, from the audience, but I want to ask you, um, you know, knowing you're a, a, a real cinephile and when we were thinking that we would be doing this screening with you, we thought we would be at the theaters, uh, that we would have reopened and we were talking about a list of films that we would be showing with you and having you talk about and some of them were the films of such a Ritre. So when you go and film in India, is that, do you have such a Ritre films in mind? Is that something that you were in dialogue with when you were planning this film? I mean, certainly he left a huge mark on me. Um, in fact, I, I came to know Ray in my time at Columbia when James was my professor. Uh, Arvind and I were classmates there. And um, at that time, Scorsese, restored and re-released, re I think, nine Ray films. And they would play every two weeks at the Lincoln uh, Plaza Cinema, Dan Talbot, Dan, Dan Talbot's old cinema who passed away. Um, and so we would go every two weeks to watch a Ray movie from Columbia to, to 63rd Street. And then we would walk from 63rd Street to 116th Street talking about the movie we had seen. And so Ray goes into that group of films that James mentioned like Kiarostami in Iran or the Italian neorealists, or let's say Ken Loach in England that kind of left a, a, a real mark on me in terms of the type of cinema I liked and the focus on people that I was interested in. So that was al always there in India. Um, we talked a lot about it with Tess Joseph, the casting director, because she was from his hometown. Mm -hmm. And um, so there was a lot of conversations with her about Ray. And then I think we talk about some other movies too, like I mentioned Goodfellas, or we talk about Kieslowski also, Kieslowski one and five. Um, the, len the lens choices in, in those films are really, the lens choice and the, 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 the physical distance of the camera to the actor and the actor to the landscape in those Kieslowski films, I thought created a real psychological feeling um, that I thought could be good for this movie. Thank you. Back to um, audience question. Uh, was there any worry that when um, a shock murder occurred, 
that you would lose the audience sympathy for the hero? A hundred percent, yes. In fact, I'm surprised I didn't lose more people. Meaning, uh, I'm very happy the movie seems to be doing very well and I've gotten a lot of good feedback and it's being seen by a lot of people. I, I actually thought half of those people would have rejected the film for the re reason of this question. Um, because, it, and that's part of the novel. The novel is often divisive for that reason because as Balram himself says, uh, he wished he had killed the mongoose, you know? Um, and I think that's part of what makes the novel and I hope the film challenging. Um, in the sequence of the murder in the rain, uh, I knew I wanted it to be personal and, and immediate, which is why it's handheld and right there with them. But I also wanted it to be epic, which is why there's one medium lens wide shot at 96 frames in the rain, um, hoping for some kind of, you know, a lot of rain, like a Kurosawa style rain, because um, I wanted it to be epic. It's not just Balram killing a shook, it's servant killing master. It's a generation and generation battle between rich and poor. Um, and I was hoping that the film could transcend personal to something more epic. And maybe people feel that around the world because of the growing gap in, in, in wealth inequality. Maybe people feel that in the world now more than ever because of COVID exposing the fault lines more where we feel like, why are we one paycheck away or one illness away from being homeless? And then another human being can make 40, you know, 400 million more dollars in one month than everybody else. What, what the hell is that? Something doesn't make sense in all that. And so I think that feeling helped people understand the, the ballroom's action, yeah. Maybe staying on that, um, maybe that's, you know, you answered it a bit, but we have a, a question that I, I just want to know if there's anything that you want to inspire the audience through your work in this film. And it's a greetings from Mexico. So oh, okay, hi. In, in the continuation yeah. of, uh, you know, the- Mexico, the God, uh, uh, it's such great cinema. Um, Ray Gadas and my good friend David Pablo is making such good films there in Mexico. Um, it's hard to say. I, I don't like to tell people what they should or shouldn't think, but I, I, I hope it in, engages people in a dialogue about, about what, why the world is the way it is that these situations exist. I hope in, in I think in a lot of countries, you, you basically have servants. I, I know there was a a recent film made in Mexico about a servant that had a different emotional quality to it that was interesting, but I, I don't know if that's how I see it personally. Um, I think, I don't know, I, I, I think if, uh, I guess if I was a servant, I, I can understand Balram's position. Um, and for those of us in, in the Western world, I think we all have servants there. Uh, um, there's a Rolodex of, uh, of servants on our, our cell phones because I can call Uber drivers or seamless delivery people to come to my door and bring me food or put together a table from Ikea from TaskRabbit. And to me, those are all ballrooms showing up at my door. And I think the Western world is increasingly reaching for and striving for having this kind of servitude in our lives. And I hope we could try to find some way around that and, and go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um question about you mentioned that there are moments in the film that to this day you can't really explain uh, even to yourself as a director during production how do you how did you discern when it was okay not to know uh, a really hard question I mean you're kind of just going on instinct and hoping it doesn't fall flat I mean I remember when we shot the scene where Balram encounters that crafting man and they just start laughing. I remember the actor was terrified that it was ter He thought it was garbage. He didn't understand. He just thought he had messed it up and he wanted to, to go back days later and do it again. Um, but I said no, because I actually, it was one of the few times I called 
of Brooklyn. And I said, could you just cut it together? I want to just see what that is. And I, I didn't know if it would be good in the movie, but it seemed okay and it seemed strange. So you're, you're going on instinct, I think. Um, I just believed I should shoot it that way. Um, same with the times where he's saying things that he's not really saying. Um, honestly, I just hoped that people would go with it. I, 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 I can't say more than that. I, I felt more loose and confident making the movie than I had ever felt before on set. And I, I had more fun making this film than I had ever had before. And if anyone knows me, fun is not a word that is typically used to describe me. So I don't know, I had fun making it with my team. I, I liked my crew and I liked my actors a lot. And the actors liked one another. They really liked each other. And I think you can feel it that the actors liked each other. And I liked them to improvise, you know, I, I, I encourage them to search around and find new emotions or new dimensions to the scene. And I would rearrange my camera for them. You know, um, I don't like action or cut. I don't say those things on set. Um, and I, I like the actors to be free and to, to risk anything they want. It doesn't matter if it does or doesn't work, let them risk, you know. Thank you so much. We have many other questions from the audience. I'd like to finish with one where um, one of our audience members say, how was the film uh, received in India? You mentioned that your family in Iran was able to see it. Yeah. How was it re received in India? And um, have you heard any feedback? I think it's been received re really well. Honestly, since the movie came out, it's been the number one film in India, including number one on top of all their series as well since it came out until now. And I think this is now day, I don't know, um, 15 or 14, I don't know how many days it's been since January 22nd till now, but it's been the number one movie since then until now. And um, I think it's striking a chord with people and they're engaged in dialogue and I hope, and uh, it seems they've enjoyed it. Yeah, which is cool. I wish I could be there. We were supposed to go there and, and be with people to watch it with them, but with COVID we're stuck here on Zoom. I was supposed to be with you there. Yeah, we will all catch up once our theaters are safe yeah. again to open so that we can all enjoy on the big screen uh, the film that you are making and that our fellow uh, filmmakers are making. I want to thank you, uh, Ramin, for spending the time with us. Um, looking forward to a time where we all together at the theaters. I want to thank the audience as well for all their questions. 